Well, I, uh, great encouragement. It's, uh, it, uh, it is true. We have a tendency to be weary in well-doing, and uh, I think it's a great point. Uh, just about the, if you're about ready to, be, to faint, be encouraged. <laughs> that, that means you're about ready to reap a reward. Uh, again, these guys are in the midst of uh, nothing that we'll ever have to experience, uh, and God gives them a vision of, uh, of the end. We've, we've talked it before in the uh, context of or, or an illustration of, of a football game, uh, uh, the idea, would, would you want to, to be winning the whole game and then lose at the end, or would you rather be losing or appear to be losing and then win at the end? I think we'd all <laughs> rather be on the side that wins in the end, and chapter 14 is meant to give us that, uh, that vision. I was reading Psalm uh, 73 the other day, and it's kind of the classic where the, the psalmist is is saying in verse 3, uh, for I was envious of the boastful when I saw the prosperity of the wicked. And, he, and, he, and he, then he goes through a, a bunch of questions where he's really questioning God and God's goodness and uh, whether God is reliable or, or not. Uh, he says in verse 16, when I thought about how to understand this, it was too painful for me until I went into the sanctuary of God, then I understood their end. And then he goes on, and his whole perspective begins to, uh, to change. Uh, because for us, uh, there, there are those that are out there, they're certainly against us. We have a real enemy that is alive and well and, uh, and, is, and is attacking us and our, our families and our, our marriages and our kids uh, on a regular basis. And uh, we can watch all that's going on in the world and become discouraged and, uh, and be weary in, in well-doing. So I think chapter 14 is a good uh, reminder for us uh, as well. Again, the context is the 144,000. They were introduced to us and back in chapter 7. Uh, there, in, there, there in verse 2 it says, Then I saw another angel ascending from the east, having the seal of the living God. And he cried with a loud voice to the four angels to whom it was granted to harm the earth and the sea, saying, Do not harm the earth, the sea, or the trees, Till we have sealed the servants of our God on their foreheads. And I heard the number of those who were sealed, 144,000 of all the tribes of the children of Israel were, uh, were sealed. So we're going to learn a little bit more about them and what that seal was. But, uh, uh, but obviously, it was they were sealed for protection, but also a seal represents ownership. And we're going to try to uh, see what we can learn from these 144,000 after all. God uses them to bring about the greatest revival in history. So what is it about their lives that we can learn from them that God might use us to lead others, others to faith in Christ as well? Let's look at the, uh, the first five verses there of, uh, of Revelation 14. And uh, I'll need to look it up myself. I'm thinking, well, I know where to find it in the Bible, though. So it's a little tougher when you uh, open up and go, it's uh, Habakkuk 3. Um, that's when you have your uh, little bookmark in there. So people know, you, you know where all those minor prophets are. Verse 1, Then I looked, and there before me was the Lamb standing on, the Mount, on Mount Zion, and with him 144,000 who had his name and had his father's name written on their foreheads, I heard a sound from heaven like the roar of rushing waters and like a loud peal of thunder. The sound I heard was like that of harpists <coughs> playing their harps, and they sang a new song before the throne and before the four living creatures and the elders. No one could learn the song except the 144,000 who had been redeemed from the earth. These are those who did not defile themselves with women, for they kept themselves pure they follow the lamb wherever he goes. They were purchased from among men and offered his first fruits to God and the lamb. No lie was found in their mouths. They were blameless. So six things at the end that are mentioned about them. But again, back in, in verse 1, the lamb is standing down uh, on Mount Zion. A couple of things need to be said about that. And the first one is that, the, that they are, he is standing there with the 144,000. John begins uh, this uh, chapter by saying, then I looked and behold. He does that. This is the eighth time he does that. And each time he does that, he's kind of announcing a, a new section uh, in the book. There's a new vision. There's something different going on here that we need to take note of in the introduction of uh, another portion, major portion. 
And again, the 144,000, we're told, were sealed by God on their foreheads. Uh, and now we're given more information about it, that it was the name of Jesus and the name of the Father that uh, uh, is on them. Uh, and again, this meant that the Lord would be with them wherever they would go. He would protect them. They have these cataclysmic supernatural events and judgments that are being poured out that we've already kind of gone through, the seal judgments, uh, as well as the uh, trumpet judgments, which will bring about, again, the bold judgments in the end. So uh, we've got about half the population of the earth that have been killed already at, uh, at this point from those judgments. You also, and they're protected from them. And then also with that, you've got the Antichrist who wants to go after them, uh, and he is uh, unable to do that. They are protected uh, from that as well. Jesus said in Matthew 28, 20, and lo, I am with you always, even to the, to the end of the age. And uh, it's like uh, uh, getting on a, one of the planes one time, and there was a, a gal that was a, a Catholic nun uh, sitting next to me, and she seemed to be very nervous. I could tell she probably didn't fly much, so I tried to, well, she's, you know, encourage her with the word, and I told her, you know, uh, you know, you really don't have to worry. You know, I fly all the time. And uh, besides that, Jesus said, and lo, I will be with you always, even to the end of the age. And she said, yeah, he said, lo. But, <laughs> no, it, but it's, sorry, just, you know, we had a little extra time. I thought I would throw it in. <clears throat> but uh, again, Jesus will be with us to the very end. Certainly that's spoken to us, but in particular, it's spoken to these guys. They are at literally the very end of the age. And whatever they're going to go through, the Lord is going to be with them, and they have that assurance. But the whole point is we, we have the same assurance ourselves. Uh, the writer of Hebrews in chapter 13, verse 5 says, Or he himself has said, I will never leave you nor forsake uh, you. So we may boldly say, the Lord is my helper. I will not fear. What can man do to me? And certainly uh, every indication because of the results of their ministry, uh, they, f they firmly believe that. And uh, I think we need to, to believe that as well. That is, Paul says, nothing can separate us from the love of God that's in Christ Jesus. You know, he starts the chapter, no condemnation to those that are in Christ Jesus there in Romans 8. Uh, he ends by saying, and I am persuaded that neither death nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, or, nor death, nor any other created thing shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. I think that's pretty clear. <laughs> whatever we, we have to go through, the Lord's going to be with us. And in the midst of whatever we're going through, regardless of what we feel like, there's nothing that can separate us from the love of God that's in Christ Jesus. And I think like these guys, we need to be reminded also of the, of the end of the story. Again, the, at the end, it says, if you read this book, it's a blessing. It's meant to be a blessing to you. But when you read the book, it's, there's a lot of horrific things that are going on here. It's like, how in the world is this a blessing to read the book of Revelation? Because we see the end. We see the end of the story and these guys in the midst of it are going to get a glimpse uh, of, of the end. The, land, the lamb is standing on Mount Zion. He's with the 144,000. But again, it's, it's a picture of, uh, of the future that's meant to give them an assurance. <coughs> in, <coughs> excuse me. In the Old Testament, uh, Zion was always a reference to Jerusalem. And if you go to Israel today and and you ask the cab driver in Jerusalem to take you to Mount Zion, he's going to take you to a particular place. It's where David's tomb is. It's where the upper room is. And you'll go to Mount Zion. It's more like a hill. <laughs> it's not much of a mountain because the whole thing is kind of a, a big, a big pla plateau. So any time in the Old Testament, people talked about literally going to Mount Zion. They were going to Jerusalem. That's where they were, were headed. But there's also lots of <clears throat> phrases in the Old Testament, and I've given you a host of references uh, in, in your notes where when they're talking about Mount Zion in a, in a greater sense, they're talking about the, the Messianic hope. They're talking about that the Messiah is going to come and the Messiah is going to establish his kingdom. Uh, and therefore, Jewish people today in the last century or so who have gone back to Israel believing that in going, they are fulfilling prophecy, they are called Zionists because they are looking and hoping for the uh, Messiah to come. Now, of course, we hope that they come to know him, you know, uh, sooner rather than, uh, than later. But Jesus will come, the Messiah will come, and this, that's what there's a picture of, of, of here. 
Hebrews 12, 22 says this about uh, Mount Zion. But you've come to Mount Zion, into the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem. So literally, again, it's the, the Mount Zion that we're reading about in chapter 14 is a picture of the new Jerusalem, the holy city. To an innumerable company, company of angels, to the general assembly of the church of the firstborn who are registered in heaven, to God the judge of all, to the spirits of just men made perfect, to Jesus the mediator of a new covenant, and to the blood of the sprinkling that speaks better things than that of Abel. So again, Mount, uh, Mount Zion, it's uh, the messianic kingdom. And that's what they're seeing in chapter 14. Uh, John is, it says, I'm seeing something I haven't seen before. He's announcing something that's different and major in the book. And what it is is that he's got a vision that's taking him to the, to the end. Because what's about ready to be described <coughs> to us in terms of the second half of the tribulation is horrifying. Uh, it's uh, incredible what's, what's going to happen. You have a worldwide revival, and anybody that receives Christ is going to be martyred almost, almost immediately. You've got uh, half the people of the earth that have already been killed. You've got pestilence. You've got wars. You've got supernatural disasters, all these things going on. And that was all the warm-up. Now the bad things happen in the second half of the tribulation. <clears throat> and it's no wonder that God comes in at this point and gives John a vision of the end to say, remind everybody, this is the end. And that's what we're living for, is the end. We're not living for here and now. We're living for that future, uh, Mount Zion, the holy city, the new Jerusalem. And uh, the 144,000 are going to be there, and they're living through a horrific time, but we're going to be there uh, as, as well. Psalm 2, uh, let me just give a couple of verses that talk about this idea of Mount Zion being uh, Bible prophecy fulfilled. In Psalm 2, very messianic psalm, says, Yet I have set my king on my holy hill of Zion. I will declare the decree. The Lord has said to me, You are my son. Today I have begotten you. Ask of me, and I will give you the nations for your inheritance and the ends of the earth for your possession. You shall break them with a rod of iron. You shall dash them to pieces like a potter's vessel. So again, Jesus is the, the king, the son that is coming, uh, and he has been set on the holy hill, uh, Mount Zion. Psalm 132, verse 13 says, <clears throat> For the Lord has chosen, <clears throat> excuse me, the Lord has chosen Mount Zion, or Zion, he has desired it for his dwelling place. This is my resting place forever. Here I will dwell for I have desired it. So again, it was, uh, Mount Zion has everything to do with <clears throat> a literal place on the planet, if you went there today. But it speaks of a, of a place in the future in terms of the Messianic kingdom. And um, added to that, John does a, a little thing in a, in a Greek text when he says uh, about the lamb standing there. He uses a perfect tense, which means that it's in the past, and it continues in the future. It's not, it's not going to stop. It's just going to continue. Could have used a, a different tense just to say it's going to happen or it did happen, but he uses a tense that says it's happened and it's going to continue to happen, and there's nothing that's going to stop it, and it will continue to have an impact on, on everything about our lives and, and the lives of everyone in this world because Jesus Christ is the Messiah, and he's going to stand on Mount Zion. Now, again, we almost need to kind of backtrack and go through that to really get that. But who's being spoken to? Who's been meant to be encouraged? 144,000 Gentiles. No, Jews. That, and when they say <clears throat> Mount Zion and the Lamb, and, you know, they, they got the picture. We've been, just been projected into the future. Everything we've hoped for, everything we dreamt of, everything we studied in the scriptures, no matter what's going on in our lives right now, and it's, it's going to be very horrific for them in terms of what they're going to face and going out and sharing the gospel and not, not being weary and well-doing and feigning, it's all going to be worth it because it's all true. And we're going to be there with the Lord someday. Again, meant to be an encouragement to them. I think it should be to us as well. The third thing is the Lamb is standing on Mount Zion with those who have been sealed. It says they belong to God and, and to the Lamb. And, and this is in contrast to the, the mark that is on everybody else, right? Everybody else has got the mark of the beast, which means, and we're going to get a little more information about that in this chapter, 
they knowingly, when they do that, they knowingly bow their knee uh, to, to the Antichrist and to Satan. Nobody will say, I didn't know. I just wanted to buy a, <clears throat> you know, a couple of loaves of bread. <clears throat> and it was the only way that they would let me buy or sell. That's not the case at all. Everybody will know very clearly what they're, what they're doing. <clears throat> Pay no attention to this frog that's in my throat. He's going to jump out any minute, and um, so don't pay any attention to him. But uh, again, it's the, um, the land that's standing on Mount Zion with those that have been uh, sealed. But we've been sealed also. Paul says in uh, Ephesians 1.13, In him you were also trusted, after you heard the word of the truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also, having believed, you were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise, who is the guarantee of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession to the praise of his glory. So we've also been sealed, and we've also been told, I'll be low, <laughs> I'll be with you to the ends of the earth. Um, nothing can separate us from the love of God that's in, in Christ Jesus. They were sealed in contrast to the mark of the beast where other people that were sealed in, we've been sealed to the Holy Spirit as a guarantee. Sometimes that word, I think NIV says uh, deposit. And we get the idea and sometimes give the illustration. It's like you want to buy a used car and so you give a deposit until you can come back and pay the full amount so that that which you value will be held for you. Uh, that's not the word that's used here. It's the word that's closer to the idea of an engagement ring. There's, there, there's, when God compares his love for us, it's not a used car. It's, it's his bride that uh, it's like, here's the ring and here's the thing and we're married, but there's this time of separation. He's going to come for his bride at some point in time in the future. And he's also going to come for this 144,000 and all those that are come to faith in Christ during the tribulation period. So the lamb is standing on Mount Zion and, uh, and because of that, there's a setting for a new song that's described. And the setting includes the voice. Again, a voice that John heard. It's not voices, but again, it could be uh, several things. Certainly, it could be the voice of God. Psalm 29, his voice is described as many waters and loud thunder, similar language that we have here. <clears throat> it could also refer to the combined praise of the 144,000. That's a fairly large crowd, uh, choir. I don't know if you've ever heard of choir that quite that big before. Um, I think the biggest choir I've heard is about 50,000 guys singing at uh, Anaheim uh, uh, the Stadium, where the, base, where the, who plays there now? It's the funny name. Yeah, but it's a really long, the Los Angeles Anaheim Angels. Isn't that it? But uh, went there for a Promise Keepers event. That was a pretty cool, that was a pretty good choir, 50,000, but this is three times that size, 144,000. Um, but again, we're, we're with the Lord, <clears throat> and, and certainly could include the church age believers. And, and after all, there's a band that's playing. I don't notice you notice the instruments that they were playing. Revelation 5 8. Now, when he had taken the scroll, the four living creatures and the 24 elders, again, those elders representing the church age believers, fell before the Lamb, each having a harp. Who had the harp? Oh, the church age believers. And golden bowls full of incense, which are the prayers of the saints. So there's a couple of very cool things that are going to be going on in heaven. Even if you can't play an instrument, now apparently you're going to be able to play one then, and it's going to be a harp. You think, I like guitars better. Trust me, you'll like a harp better once you're there. And by the way, we, we come back with him in chapter 19, uh, riding on white horses. Um, I've never ridden a horse. You should work on it, because <laughs> we're going to be coming back and... It's a lot of fun besides, but uh, these things we can't do, we're going to be able to do with the Lord, and it'll be a glorious time of, of worship. And again, the idea of playing harps in heaven is not foreign to the Bible. Uh, we see it in Psalm 144, 147, 149, 150, all talking about praising God with, again, these stringed instruments. And so there's glorious praise that's going on. So the, the Lamb is with the 144,000. It's on Mount Zion, but it's not talking about a place in Jerusalem. It's talking about the holy city that's come down out of heaven at the end of all this time. So it's in future sense. It's like look into the future so that you know how to live your lives now because that's what we're really living for. And, uh, and also then, in, in midst, uh, amidst this great worship, there's a, a new song that is sung. 
in terms of what the uh, uh, song is, well, it says it's a it's uh, in fr- again in front of uh, of uh, the four living creatures, the elders. No one could learn it except the 144,000. And this all speaks of their relationship with the Lord. We've already seen the, uh, uh, our relationship, and there's a special song of redemption that church age believers sing. We saw that earlier uh, in the book. Um, you've got tribulation saints that apparently have a special place at the altar of God. They've been martyred for their faith during the tribulation. They have a special particular place at, right, at the, uh, right at the throne of God. And, of course, they're there crying out, How long, O Lord, before you avenge our blood and do something about what's going on uh, down there on, on the planet? Now you've got 144,000 that uh, evidently they have a new song to sing as, as well. But it's not a new song in terms of lyrics that they've never heard. It's like, well, what does the song sound like? What are the lyrics to this song? Well, that's, that's not the idea. That's what we think of a new. We think of new like uh, something we've never heard before. But uh, that's not the idea. It's the same word that Jesus uses in John 13, 34, where he says, a new commandment I give you, that you love one another. Now, it's not like up until now, God has never told anyone to love anybody else before. And suddenly he says, here's a really new thing. Are you ready for this? I think you should love one another. Wow, I've never heard. That's new. I've never, no, that's, that, obviously that's not what Jesus is saying. Uh, but notice what it, it goes on. It says, as I have loved you, that you also may love one another. By this all will know that you are my, dis- my disciples if you love, have love for one another. So he defines and he says and qualifies, he says, I want you to have a new kind of love that you've never had before. What is it like? It's like the love that I have for you. And this is right before he goes to the cross to die for our sins. A new command I give you that you would love. What is that love like? I'm about ready to show you. It's a sacrificial love where you lay down your lives one for another. And if you do that, all men will know you are my disciples. Again, they knew what the word love meant. And God hadn't talked about love before, but this becomes a new kind of love because it's it's, it's defined. There's a qualifying statement about it. You've never known love like this before, but you're about ready to see it. Okay, it's the same word uh, back in our uh, context of, uh, of Revelation 14. There's a new song that they sing. It's not special lyrics. Uh, it's a reality to the relationship that they have. They are going to serve the Lord. They are going to go out and be a witness for Jesus Christ. They are going to dedicate themselves to the Lord. They are going to live through and endure and get through the most horrific time the planet has ever seen in terms of of just geophysical things that are going on, in terms of persecution. It'll be the most difficult time uh, ever to be a Christian. And they're going to go through it because God's going to watch over them. He's going to protect them. He has sealed them because he is... Uh, because they belong to him, they're going to get through it. And in the end, when they stand before God and they stand before Jesus Christ as the lamb on the throne and the king of all glory, they're going to sing a song and it's going to be new because of, the, because of what they've been through, because of what they've experienced. And when they begin to sing about God's redemption, they'll know what real redemption is because they saw the worst of the worst. They will live through hell on earth. When they sing about his love, they'll know what it is, what true love is, because they will see real evil like few of us will ever see. All these things that they worship and they sing that's in this song, they're just going to know them in a different dynamic because, because of what they've been through and what God has brought them through. And what I want to suggest is that when it talks about us singing a new song with him, the church age believers, it, it, it's very much the same thing as well. We worship the Lord now, and we should worship the Lord, and, and sometimes our, we're able to focus in more, think more, have those lyrics of those songs impact our lives. We have a greater sense sometimes than, than other times that uh, God's presence is here. Obviously, God's presence is always with us, uh, uh, but sometimes if worship is, is better than, than other times, but no matter what it's like, it's pale in reflection compared to what it will be when we stand and look at Jesus face to face and worship him someday. We'll sing a new song, 
but they'll sing a new song as well. And the setting for that song is described. The third thing is 144,000 are separate, and there are six characteristics of their lives. And, and as I've been alluding to, there's obviously a lot that we can learn from them. They're going to go out, in a sense, and be a witness for Jesus Christ. And, and uh, we've talked about that a little bit. Uh, I, I, <clears throat> there's not a text that says uh, they're all 144,000 Jewish Billy Grahams, and they're going to use the fierce spiritual laws. And, you know, it doesn't say that, but it's certainly alluded to. And we'll look at that in a moment again, because they, they are more than once referred to as the first fruits. In other words, they are something of which there is something greater that is coming. And, um, and what it, the greatest thing that's going on during this time period is a, is a great worldwide revival. So they are saved, we know that, and we know that they are first fruits. That means there's lots of other people that are saved as well. And... Um, and so we've got a lot of indication that they are the ones that are out there because they're protected by God. They're able to get out there uh, and, and share the gospel. So how are they able to do it so effectively? Well, certainly they're sealed by God, but again, so, so are we. Uh, they have God going with them wherever they go, and, and so, so do we. Uh, they have been given a commission by God, but so, so have we in terms of the, uh, again, what we say commission, but literally it's the great commandment in terms of go to all the world and, uh, and preach the gospel. But notice some of the things that are about them. One is that they remain morally pure despite what's going on, and we see that in verse 4. Uh, these are the ones who were not defiled with women, for they were virgins. So uh, there's a lot of people that look at this and, and basically just uh, assume that what's being said here is that they're single. Uh, they don't. They don't get married. They just. They just stay single. And uh, I, I think that's that's true. But I think uh, the text has a lot uh, uh, more to say to us than that. It's speaking of their their moral purity. Uh, again, Paul in First Corinthians seven twenty five talks about the fact that some people have the gift of singleness, and therefore God could use them maybe uh, in a way uh, that is in a greater capacity in a certain situation than if they were married. They don't have the cares of, the, of a family. They don't have the responsibilities and so forth. So Paul basically is just not saying that everybody should be celibate, but he is saying if you're single and you have the gift of singleness, then hey, uh, be used by the, the Lord, you know, and uh, see that used to your advantage. If th that's all that meant for these guys is to be single because of Man, all the stuff that's going to be going on in planet Earth and the persecution and the judgments and so forth, why not tell every believer during that time period to be single as well? But we don't have that. So again, I think they probably are single, but the idea of the virgin is talking about their, their moral purity, uh, certainly in a Jewish context. Uh, in Matthew 25, we have the parable of the virgins that is a parable about Jewish believers and whether they're ready for the Messiah to come or not ready for him to come at the end of the tribulation. That's the context uh, of Matthew 25. And, uh, and you know the story. Uh, they, they have to wait for the call. When the wedding's held in, in those days in a Jewish context, it wasn't send out a, a beautiful uh, embossed you know, invitation that said what time to show up, what time to arrive, and there's no schedule. You just kind of, you knew it was about this time, this month, these couple of weeks, and you kind of had to just kind of hang out and wait, literally, and then uh, the, the groom, uh, groom arrives, and, and there's a big parade, and they follow him, and they go to the, uh, the, uh, the bride's home, and then the, the marriage and the supper and all would, uh, all would take place. So the, the virgins had to have oil, remember, in their lamps and be ready, and you remember then the, the call came, and some of them... They were the wise and they were the foolish. The wise had their oil. They were able to go in. The foolish did not, and they were not able to. And during the tribulation period, there'll be Jews that, that hear the call of the Messiah. They are wise. They will receive Jesus as the Messiah, and they will go in, and there are those that don't. That's what that parable is, is about. So again, in the, that context, the wise and the foolish, the wise virgins again, is speaking a lot more other than they were just single. <laughs> they, they had the oil of the Holy Spirit. They were ready. They were waiting. They were receptive. They heard the groom, and, and they went. And, uh, and these 
guys are referred to as virgins in that context. But also in terms of Israel, uh, the nation of Israel is uh, described as the virgin, the daughter of Zion, the virgin of Israel, uh, many times over. And God is constantly saying to the nation of Israel that you are to be a pure virgin. You're not to go after other idols and other gods. And it's talking, again, in the context of, of being pure in terms of your devotion to the Lord. So to, in this way, they're to be morally pure. It really means they have, they have a heart for the Lord. Their heart is, is for the Lord and given over to the Lord, and they're committed to the Lord and being directed by the Lord. So there's a lot more going on than they're single. <laughs> so that, that's my whole point. Uh, we, we can miss a whole lot by saying that these 144,000, what can we learn from them? Single. No, it's, it's, it's much more than that. It's talking about a dedication to the Lord, a commitment to the Lord, and a moral purity uh, in their own lives. Trust me, the others aren't as long as that. But number two kind of is. They are obedient to the will of God. Notice uh, verse four. They're the ones who follow the lamb wherever he goes. Again, a commitment level that's uh, seen here. Wherever the Lord leads them, wherever he would direct them, they're willing to go there. And certainly the same should be able to be said of us as well, as the Lord would lead and guide and uh, direct our lives. But notice, again, Jesus is referred to here as, as the lamb, the sacrificial lamb. Why is it that we would follow Jesus wherever he would direct us? Because he is the sacrificial lamb. He loves us. He gave his life for us. He left heaven. Again, born in, uh, you know, in, in Bethlehem, lived that perfect sinless life, fulfillment of all the prophecy, knowingly was brutalized and beaten with the cat of nine tails, went and died on a Roman cross. And therefore, we, we should be able to trust him. Anybody that lives that way, that sacrificially, with that kind of integrity, uh, we should be able to follow them wherever they, they go. Uh, and they, these guys are able to do that and apparently do do that. Jesus is a good shepherd, but here he's described as a lamb, and they follow the lamb wherever they go. John 10, I, I think of uh, there Jesus is saying that um, um, my sheep know my, my voice. They listen to me. They follow me. Uh, I give them eternal life, and they shall never perish. You know, no one can snatch them out of my hand. The Father, my Father, who is greater than all, uh, you know, he, you know, no one can snatch them out of His hand as well. You know, I and the Father are are one. Uh, Jesus is saying, "My sheep know me; they listen to my voice, and they follow me." That's a pretty good description of uh, of our lives to be able to know the Lord, to be able to hear His voice and to be able to follow him. Why would we do that? Because he has given us eternal life. That's the, the motivation. Three, they've been redeemed from among men. And of course, uh, this is speaking about uh, their salvation. So again, this 144,000 are, are, are saved. They come into a relationship with, uh, with Jesus Christ. And, and uh, we gave a couple of views on, on how this uh, actually comes about. And of course, that first view was they listen to J. Vernon McGee on the radio, and that's how they get saved. And that's a, that's a possibility. It's one view. Uh, the other view, we talked about the growing Messianic movement in Israel, the 50 plus 60 Messianic congregations that are there sharing the gospel e even today, unprecedented in the, in the history of, uh, uh, of the country uh, until now. There was a, there was a growing Messianic movement uh, uh, around the early 1900s. Uh, in Europe at that time, there was uh, documented about 225, 235 Messianic Jews uh, on, uh, on the European continent. It was growing. There was uh, lots of young leaders that were raised up, Jewish uh, that, uh, uh, believers that had the gift of evangelism that were out. There were churches that were being planted, being started. It was a tremendous movement of God, and the Holocaust killed every one of them, and it ended. All those young leaders, a whole generation, were, were killed right along with uh, all the other Jews they were trying to reach. But we, we see that changing and coming around again in the days in which uh, we live in. And it may be that God is raising up those congregations now because they're going to be there um, to uh, influence the nation and Jewish believers in the future. Uh, and again, you also have then the two witnesses that are there supernaturally, <laughs> that are proclaiming the gospel from Jerusalem 
and the Antichrist will not be able to harm them, although he will try, and they have supernatural powers, call fire down from heaven, and so forth. Uh, there's a lot of commentators that believe that uh, that's Moses and Elijah, and of course, there's a lot of, a lot of rabbis that have said, Moses and Elijah come back, tell me Jesus of Nazareth is a Messiah, I believe them, and uh, so it could be that uh, they are, but either way, they will be effective uh, in, uh, in getting the gospel out. And of course, in the middle of the tribulation, we looked at that a few weeks ago, the Antichrist then is able to, under God's sovereignty, to kill them. They lay on the streets for three days and three nights, and, uh, and uh, uh, the world rejoices and give gifts to one another uh, in celebration of that event, and then God raptures them right off the streets and, and right into heaven. But either way, this 144,000 get redeemed, they hear the gospel, uh, and they respond to it. Uh, the fourth thing about them uh, is they are the first fruits of God. And uh, first fruits is, again, one of the seven uh, Jewish feasts. And uh, a couple things about that that are uh, probably important to us as well. Uh, first fruits is the Sunday following Passover. So whenever Passover this uh, next year, I think, starts like on a, uh, a Tuesday or something. So it's an eight-day deal. Uh, and, uh, and when it ends, uh, excuse me, uh, it usually always starts on a Shabbat and runs to a Shabbat or Saturday to Saturday. And when it ends, the following Sunday then is the Feast of First Fruits. And, uh, you know, it's springtime. Uh, the crops have just gotten in. And they actually go out and they harvest prematurely. They harvest a little bit of the, say, the wheat harvest. And they bring it in. And they say, Lord, we're trusting you for a harvest in the future. So we're going to take a little bit of sampling, a portion, a small portion. And we're going to offer it to you now, trusting you're going to give us a great harvest, you know, by, by the end of the summer. Um, that is the day on which Jesus Christ rose from the dead. And that's why as believers uh, in Jesus Christ, we worship on, on Sunday, because that's the day that Jesus rose from the dead in fulfillment of first fruits. And that's what Paul tells us in 1 Corinthians 15, 23. There he refers to Jesus Christ as the first fruits in reference to the promised resurrection. The reason we worship on Sunday is because it's the day Jesus rose from the dead as a first fruits of which you and I now are part of. You and I will be resurrected from the dead because Jesus Christ was resurrected from the dead. The reason that you got out of bed this morning, the reason you're not on the beach somewhere or driving out to the North Shore to see the waves there is because Jesus Christ rose from the dead. And as believers, we get together every Sunday to celebrate the resurrection of Jesus Christ. If you didn't know that, that's what we're doing here today. We're celebrating, we worship, we pray, we go through the word strengthen ourselves, encourage ourselves, edify ourselves in God's word so we can continue to go out and tell people about the resurrection of Jesus Christ. It's why we gather. It's not just what we do on Easter. That's why we do it. That's why we do it every, every Sunday. That's why we, we get together on Sunday because of the fulfillment of a Jewish feast, first fruits. It doesn't end there. 50 days later, there's another kind of a first fruits that takes place. We call it Pentecost. I think the Hebrew word is Shavuot, and, uh, and it's 50 days later, also on a Sunday. Now it's about mid-July. You know, the, the wheat harvest, uh, the grain is a little further along, so now they go harvest a little more, and they bring it in, and they actually, um, uh, they actually bake bread from it, and then the priest takes it in the temple. They have a big celebration, makes two loaves of it, and you can ask rabbis, why are there two? I don't know, but they, they make two. I'm going to tell you why in a moment. But they take two, and they wave them before the Lord. And, of course, it was on Pentecost, and it's a first fruits offering, and it was on Pentecost that the Holy Spirit is poured out, Peter preaches, and 3,000 are added to the church. Now, the reason there's two loaves is because one represents, because what's going to happen on Pentecost? The church is going to be formed, and it's going to be formed with Jews and Gentiles. So there's two loaves that are waved uh, before, before the Lord. Now what's interesting about that in terms of 3,000 then are the first fruits, a small sampling of church age believers that get saved. What's the small sampling during the tribulation? 
144,000. I think that means there's going to be a really a lot of people that get saved <laughs> during, during the tribulation. If the small sampling of first fruits was 3,000 to represent all church age believers for 2,000 years, during the tribulation period, the small sampling is 144,000. That's what it says. It says they are the first fruits of, uh, again, these believers that are saved uh, during the tribulation period. So uh, very, very significant uh, that uh, uh, these guys are meant to be uh, encouraged by what uh, is going to happen in the future. Uh, they're living through it right now, and they're being reminded that, that the Lord is with them. Uh, they're going to worship with the Lord in a new dynamic, a new song like never before, regardless of what they're going through. The Lord's going to be with them, uh, and they are the first fruits, and God's going to do tremendous things uh, through their lives. Uh, Ezekiel 20, uh, 39, 29 prophesies a time when God would pour out his spirit on the house of Israel. And it's going to be at the end of the tribulation. And I will not hide my face from them anymore, for I shall have poured out my spirit on the house of Israel, says the Lord God. And of course, we've got other uh, passages like Zechariah 12.10, the spirit of grace and supplication will be poured up, out upon them. And we live in a day when the Holy Spirit is being poured out on Jews and Gentiles um, because of what took place in, uh, in Acts chapter 2. So... The greatest revival uh, that the history has ever known is still uh, yet, yet future. And Paul talks about it in, uh, in chapter 11 of, uh, of Romans. There he says, For I do not desire, brethren, that you should be ignorant of this mystery, lest you should be wise in your own opinion. What's the mystery? That blindness in part has happened to Israel until the fullness of Gentiles have come in. A very misunderstood passage. Uh, it, means, it doesn't mean that all Jews everywhere are partially blind so they can't receive the gospel. That's the way it's been interpreted by some people. It just means during this time period when Jews and Gentiles are getting saved, not all Jews are going to get saved. Of course, not all Gentiles are going to get saved either because there's a partial blindness. Because there is a time in the future, Paul's going to say, when all Israel does get saved. Not, all, not every Jewish person is going to get saved during the church age. But certainly, proportionally, you would think there would be as many Jews as there would be Gentiles. We don't find that happening. And I think that's primarily because of a satanic deception that's been on the church for much of the church age. But notice verse 26, And so all Israel will be saved, as it is written, The Deliverer will come out of Zion, and he will turn away ungodliness from Jacob. For this is my covenant with them when I take away their sins. So in the end, remember that remnant of Jews that God is protecting out there in the plains of Jordan or Petra or Basra, wherever he's got them, uh, they will all turn to the Lord and cry out for him. That's what brings Jesus back to planet Earth at the end of the tribulation. But, uh, but again, here we have a time, we live in a time when God is pouring out his spirit, saving people, uh, but there's a, a tremendous time in the future that's coming, and these guys really need to be encouraged because of what they're living through right, right during that time. Fifth, uh, they have no deceit in their mouths. The word uh, deceit or no guile means there's nothing false in them. That's in comparison to, comparison to a false religious system, a false prophet that are going about. Uh, the, the opposite of, is true of this 144,000. If we're going to be effective in sharing the gospel of Jesus Christ, there needs to be no guile, no, nothing false about, about who we are and the way we represent uh, the kingdom of God. Six, they are without fault. And again, this reemphasizes their, their moral purity. So again, the true believers are, are the opposite of, uh, they're not false prophets, they're, they're true prophets. They're, they're the opposite of everything that's out there uh, in, in the world. And again, the same, is, the same word is used to describe us by Paul in Ephesians 1.4. Just as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame, is the same word, without fault, before him uh, in love. So again, my, my point in all this, I think John's point in all of this is that, is that you know, this document could have been hidden away just so that you know, people going through this time could somehow discover it, but it's not. Uh, it's part of scripture. It's preserved through time so that you and I could read and know ahead 
what's going to happen during this time period, even though we're not going to be here, even though we're going to be, uh, be in heaven. So why do we need to know? If we're, and I think it's because we're to be encouraged, to know the end of the story, to know that the Lamb will stand on Mount Zion. He will be with that 144,000, but we'll be with him as well. They will sing a new song because there'll be a new dynamic to the relationship that they have because of what they've gone through, what they've endured, and what words like redemption, uh, what words like grace, and words like mercy will take on a completely different meaning to them because of their relationship with the Lord and now the reality of being with Him in heaven. You know, I think the same could be said for us. Uh, there's a, a new love that we can have one for another because we understand what what sacrificial love is in Jesus Christ. But also there's a new song that we'll sing as well. I think many of these things that apply to them certainly uh, applies to us. And I think it's a great, uh, great example that the Lord has given us to, uh, to follow. So what do, you, what do you think about the blue robe? You think, no? Okay, what do you think about not being weary and well-doing? And just when you think you're going to, I love that, just when you think you're going to faint, that's when you know you're, <laughs> you're close. It's not sinful to be weary, uh, and there's nothing sinful about feeling like you're going to faint, but when you feel like you're going to faint, don't faint. It's a great, great line. Let's pray. Lord, I pray that we would be uh, encouraged again to know that we will be with you one day and that that's what we should be living for. Uh, that we would be encouraged to share your love with those around us, share the gospel with those around us, Lord. It's a, a lost and a dying world, so many people out there with no hope at all, Lord, and, uh, and we have you, and the blessed hope. So, Lord, I pray that we would be encouraged just to, uh, to fulfill the great commandment, to go into all the world and share the gospel uh, with uh, everyone that you bring across our path that we would not be weary in well-doing. In Jesus' name, amen.